Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Breast Practices here on Facebook Live, where each week we have the chance to speak to my guest experts about best practices for guiding the breast cancer treatment journey. You know, nurses are such an integral part of the cancer care team, often answering questions and offering advice and recommendations as part of patient care. And today we'll be learning about the role of a nurse navigator, what it is, what they do, and the difference they can make for patients. I'm Fazla Seeker, the president and CEO of Molly Surgical. And here with us today is Lily Shockney, a registered nurse well known in the cancer field through her countless contributions and awards around improving the breast cancer patient experience. She is a university distinguished service professor of breast cancer at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore after serving as the administrative director at the Breast Center and director of the cancer survivorship programs. She is the co-creator of WorkStride, Managing Cancer at Work, an employee benefit program offered across the U.S. businesses and corporations. She's also the co-founder of the Academy of Oncology Nurse and Patient Navigators, AONN+, and she's the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Oncology Navigation and Survivorship. In a particularly touching video that I watched on the Johns Hopkins website, um, she shares why she does what she does. Having been diagnosed twice with breast cancer herself, she knew her calling was to specialize in serving other breast cancer patients. Also today uh, with us is our guest, Judy Oaks. She was first diagnosed with stage two breast cancer 30 years ago. And for the last 11 years, she's been living with metastatic breast cancer. She got to personally experience the importance of nurse navigators for helping patients to stay balanced. Lily and Judy, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for thank having you. us. Just before we get started, I'd like to give a quick reminder to our viewers to go ahead and comment below with your thoughts and questions. We are live, and so it's a great chance to get in on the conversation. Or you can also give us a like or a share. Let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to start first with learning more about what a nurse navigator is and what they do. Lily, would you like to start? Is a nurse navigator a subspecialty of nursing? How does it work? It is a subspecialty of nursing and it uh, focuses at this point in time specifically on oncology patients, though there is some growth happening also for chronic diseases and other disorders. Mm -hmm. So an oncology nurse navigator, the number one thing that she does is serve as a patient advocate. She is responsible for providing patient education to the patient as well as to their uh, family caregivers, which could be several people in their family. Uh, also making sure that if there are any barriers to care or treatment, that she identifies those barriers and eliminates those barriers. The number one barrier in the United States is transportation. Patients may take a bus to school, excuse me, to the hospital um, uh, where they work, but perhaps they're getting their radiation elsewhere where there is no bus. Uh, transportation is something that can be provided for free. There's many advocacy organizations that actually do uh, provide uh, taxi vouchers or have volunteers that will pr provide free rides. Uh, the second number one barrier, which is rapidly becoming the leading barrier, are financial barriers. Absolutely. We're living in a time where uh, drug costs are very high. Uh, we also uh, have situations where people cannot afford to take time off from work. They can't have their paycheck short. Right now in the middle of a pandemic, many of these individuals being diagnosed with cancer are unemployed. They also have lost their health insurance. So financial barriers is big. And again, there are advocacy organizations to assist um, with this. Psychosocial support is really important as well. And being a touchstone from the point of diagnosis all the way through to the end of treatment, whether that be into short and long-term survivorship or that it be to end of life. So I think it's a very special role for nurses uh, usually uh, a clinical oncology nurse would just see the patient for a snapshot of time, like in an infusion center getting their chemo. They see them every three weeks for four hours. They wouldn't know them personally, wouldn't know if they were married, didn't know if they had kids, didn't know what was important to them. What brings them joy? What are their goals? What are their life goals? What's important to them? Yeah. And as a nurse navigator, we do get into the patient's life in that level of detail. You touched on so many things and it's going to be such a rich conversation. I will want to come back to um, the social disparities um, 
uh, issue that you brought up, something that's very important to me and racial disparities as well. But before I do, I first want to come over to Judy. Judy, tell us about how a nurse navigator made a difference for you as a breast cancer patient. Well, Lily calls it special. Um, in my life, uh, it brought me balance, uh, hope. Uh, it eliminated fear. And it was someone that had what I call listening ears and a caring heart. And it's so important. And I think that it's something that needs to be integrated into the healthcare system. Uh, I'm a major advocate of mind, body, spirit, and keeping yourself balanced. And a nurse navigator uh, has those skills to do that for you. So it was, um, it was almost miraculous that Lily and I were under treatment at the same time. Um, we actually met at a social gathering first, and then we were under treatment around the same time also. And so I have watched this special gift that Lily has uh, turn into something that can be made national. I mean, it's very needed in the healthcare industry to integrate this type of support, which is so very much needed from both the mental health and just a holistic approach uh, to caring for people who are um, fighting a disease that, that comes on you. Um, when I was diagnosed at the age of 46 and was told you have a life-threatening disease, I felt betrayed by my body. I had no symptoms whatsoever. It was picked up by a mammogram. And I felt um, that was the only time in my life I felt white terror. I thought, I'm going to be dead in a week. And it was, uh, and I have talked with many women just like me, same kind of thing. So uh, I'm so glad that we're having this opportunity to talk about uh, this wonderful program uh, that is really growing and so needed. Yes, and thank you for sharing um, your stories. We've got a little bit of feedback for some reason. Um, if it's too bad, um, I can, no, it seems to go away. Okay, great. So I, I heard so much there. Um, and one, one of the things that I first want to focus on, Judy, is I just want to, if you could share a little bit more of the color of how a nurse navigator gave you hope, as you said, and balance. I think because it was an individual who I knew was hearing me and understanding what and enabled me, I think I would say that one of the things that happens that benefits all of us is we get educated, engaged, and empowered. And a nurse navigator gives you the voice and the ability and the comfort and trust to be open and share all of your concerns, no matter, um, it's so important that your questions are answered, no matter how silly you might think they are. Uh, nurse navigators have that ability to recognize many times that underneath some of those silly questions are some very serious questions. And I think that the skill sets they bring um, are very beneficial for everyone. It sounds so hard to personalize care, really personalizing the care experience. Just listening to you speak, Judy, I have the impression that the nurse navigator role um, at one point in time didn't exist. So when did the role really come into being? Lily, do you want to take that one for us? Sure. So uh, it uh, it started out initially as a patient lay navigator program back in 1992 and 1993 in Harlem, New York City, where Dr. Harold Freeman, was, who was a breast surgeon, was noting that most of the African-American women who came to the hospital where he worked there in Harlem were coming in through the emergency room with advanced breast cancer and subsequently were dying. He wanted to see if he could reduce mortality by getting them diagnosed sooner. 
and uh, created what, what was referred to as patient navigation. What it entailed was sending out into the community African-American women that lived there and knew the community. They'd knock on doors mm -hmm. and they really were um, healthcare case workers, community case workers, where they would ask the individual that answered that door, usually an African-American woman, uh, tell me, have, have you had a mammogram this year? Uh, if you having a, can you tell me why you haven't had a mammogram this year? Mm -hmm. uh, will you let me in your house for just 10 minutes to talk to you about the importance of mammography? And their, their mission was to undo myths and instill facts. They also then accompanied that individual to the mammography center, first to make sure that she came, but second, it was a friendly face that she had gotten to know there at her front door. Yeah. And that program has, has continued. In the mid 1990s is when nurse navigation uh, became truly established. And I've been uh, credited, acknowledged, if you will, uh, for uh, creating it and having it be what it is to be today, which is picking up that patient at the point of diagnosis and following her all the way through, as I said earlier, across the continuum of care, each phase of treatment, she still is at that patient's uh, side. And one of the issues that uh, a lot of people don't know is that if, if we look at the evolution of nurse navigation, it actually began uh, in not being what it is today. It actually began as utilization review nurses who reviewed medical records retrospectively to identify the days that a patient was in the hospital for which there were barriers to the patient's treatment or barriers to their discharge. And their awful job, because uh, it was a real kill the messenger, was to identify those days, carve them out so neither the hospital or the doctor got paid for them. Then it translated into utilization management in the end of the 1980s. Um, the utilization review began actually in 1971. And Concurrently, they were looking at the patient's medical record while the patient was in the hospital, asking the doctor, can you explain what the problem is, what the delay is, why they're, why the test hasn't been scheduled yet or performed, et cetera. Still adversarial. And then it uh, evolved in 1990 into case managers where the nurse was part of the treatment team, but still was very focused on prevention of hospitalizations that were unplanned, getting the patient discharged as soon as possible. So it still focused a lot on money, quite frankly. And then in the mid 1990s uh, was when I began the nurse navigation program at Johns Hopkins, where I really did want it to be that patient advocate. And uh, something that Judy just said was the level of trust that a patient uh, has with uh, her nurse navigator. So there are oncology nurse navigators all across the country today, just as the membership of AONN Plus, we have over 9,000 of them uh, as members. And every kind of cancer, as you can imagine, deserves and should have um, such an individual to be providing them this level of support. And the, the navigator is the patient's voice also when the patient isn't there. And I'll, I'll give you a quick example of that. Uh, weekly cancer centers hold what are called tumor boards or multidisciplinary case conferences mm -hmm. where they're gonna be discussing a newly diagnosed patient or a patient who has progressed with their cancer getting worse. And the team, the multidisciplinary team, so the surgical oncologist, medical oncologist, right. radiologist, right. the whole team, right down to the genetics person and the pathologist and that nurse navigator, discuss this patient's situation and come up with some uh, treatment options. Mm -hmm. For those with metastatic disease, oftentimes we may be looking at very aggressive toxic treatments if they've been blowing through many lines of therapy at this point. I, as a nurse navigator, know what the patient has shared with me because I've discussed it with her. What do you want to do next? Right. And if that patient has said to me, I don't want to do any more treatment, but I don't want to hurt my, my doctor's feelings by, by not doing it. I'm going to be the one to say, wait a minute, there's no need for us to be talking about eighth line, ninth line treatment. 
uh, that's going to make her really sick. She wants to discontinue aggressive treatment and now focus on hospice at home, mm -hmm. make sure that we continue her palliative care and uh, give her time with her family and with herself to get closure with her life. So I bring all that to a very quick halt and uh, nurse navigators are respected by that physician team because we are representing the patient. Yeah, thank you so much for that historical perspective about how the role came to be. Um, I had no idea and that just gave so much insight. And um, so now I'd like to go ahead and talk a little bit about, so how would a breast cancer patient, their family or their caregivers for that matter, um, get a nurse navigator? Do they request one? Um, are they available everywhere or only at large academic centers like Johns Hopkins? And I'd love to hear both your perspectives and experience with the healthcare system. Yeah, so the majority of cancer centers and breast centers, uh, it, it began with breast cancer because that's one of the largest uh, patient populations for being diagnosed and treated uh, in the United States and actually around the world. So breast cancer nurse navigators did begin with that specialty. And you're looking at 300,000 women diagnosed a year, about 2,000 men diagnosed a year, and 39,000 uh, women dying each year of this disease. So it got its home base beginning with, uh, with, with breast cancer patients. Uh, as I say, the majority of cancer centers and certainly breast centers do have navigators today. Mm -hmm. Any uh, institution that wants to be accredited by the Commission on Cancer, which is an important thing to, to do. It means that they are meeting standards of care. They are following the best quality of care and best evidence-based practices are required to have nurse navigators. Uh, if they don't, then they don't meet the specific standards in order to be accredited. Right. And uh, there are some smaller institutions, community cancer centers, who only, maybe only see, I'm gonna say 200 cancer patients a year of all kinds of cancers, uh, breast, prostate, lung, you know, colorectal, et cetera. They're probably only gonna have one nurse navigator there because they don't have a big enough volume of a particular kind of cancer that would warrant having specialization like that. That's a, a very talented nurse navigator because she has to keep up to date with all of the treatments that are uh, being developed and then subsequently approved as results of clinical trial successes and the FDA approving new new treatments. So she's got a she's got a very busy job, not just taking care of a variety of different kind of cancer patients, but staying um, abreast of all of the the, the treatments that are uh, uh, evolving um, every month. There's there's new drugs. It's really truly really quite tremendous. Judy, how about from your perspective, um, how do you go about getting a, a nurse navigator and what advice um, do you have to patients that might be watching in our audience? Um, I'm treated both at Hopkins and in Lancaster mm -hmm. at the Barsinger Cancer Center, which is part of LGH Penn Medicine. And they do have a nurse navigator. Uh, it's interesting because um, I'm such an advocate that I've actually been able to have some conversations with the nurse navigators um, and good interchanges about talking with patients and things, uh, which has been, it's a win-win. Um, there, are, there are things that, um, and it is as Louie described, at Hopkins, I've been presented to the tumor board uh, my guess is Lily has represented me a few times. Um, and I think basically there are so many things that I want to share with women as far as don't be afraid to ask for things that you need. Um, I think if I ruled the world in the medical field, I would take the word decision out of the medical speak when people are talking to you about, first you're dealing with, you have a life-threatening disease, mm -hmm. and then you're given these opportunities, and every woman is different. I prefer to make informed choices. Um, I have met women that don't wanna hear anything about their cancer, just get rid of it. I've heard 
the middle ground with it, but it basically for me has worked to create a team and also to know that you really don't go in there with a medical degree yourself. So that word decision can be a little bit frightening to people about, oh, are you going to have a going to have your breast removed? Are you going to have a lumpectomy? And all these new words are coming into your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And what you really are doing is you get to make choices. And it's up to you, but I think it's very important to be part of your team. And you need to have a team to deal with this kind of journey in your life. And so it includes, um, I keep all of my, my physicians and my team informed. Everybody knows everything about all the things that are going on. Um, so I would urge, I would urge women, if you cannot speak for yourself, uh, say so say so because the help is there and someone will speak for you um and don't be afraid to ask the questions i know uh, many people now will go in with their printout from the internet with their list of questions and that's okay too but uh for me personally um if someone if a physician will not take the time to answer your questions or refuse in any way I move on. Yeah, absolutely. Move on. And that's something that we've discussed so much on um, uh, past episodes of the show focused on shared decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, just go out and find a doctor who will listen to you. Absolutely. I really okay. appreciated that distinction that you made between decision and choice because it kind of helps remove that pressure of it's your choice, right? It's not a decision. It's not the big decision. It's your choice. Let me also comment uh, that uh, uh, some patients are are frightened to participate yeah. mm -hmm. uh, in in making a choice because they'll say, "I'm not a doctor. You're the doctor," um, and the physician may say, "Well, I presented three options to you, so you pick which one you want." And they're still petrified that they just found out they've got breast cancer. For heaven's sakes! Um, so that that's that's a a, a tall order. Um, additionally. Uh, what we're really talking about is patient-centered care. That this patient is far more than her pathology, right? She just isn't a, in this case for Judy, a, a patient with stage four breast cancer, yeah. right? She had a life before she was diagnosed. We want her to have a life while she's undergoing treatment. That's really important. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and for her to find joy in, in each day. Some of the questions that that we ask patients um, at Johns Hopkins are, how much do you know about your cancer? Just to make sure that people aren't confused. I've had a patient that has said, I have stage three breast cancer and it's grade one. And then I look at the medical record and it's stage one, grade three. Totally different, right? In one yep. case, I'm gonna say, you're gonna be fine. In the other case, I'm gonna say, I'm worried. Right. <laughs> yep. And, uh, how much do you want to know about your cancer? As you just said, not everybody wants to know everything. Right. Then what are you hoping for? What are you most worried about at this point in time right now? Because we're going to keep asking these questions each time we see you. And tell me three things that bring you joy. I also want to know what her life goals are. You know, I, I had a, a young woman in her late twenties diagnosed uh, with, with breast cancer. She happened to carry a, a gene mutation, uh, BRCA1 gene mutation, uh, was newly engaged, worked as, as a bank teller. I was gathering all this information from her. And I, I said to her, well, I see the diamond ring on your finger. When are you getting married? And she said a year and a half from now. And I thought, okay, her hair will be back on her head. Um, we will be done acute treatment by then. Uh, and um, I said, so you're a bank teller. Do you, uh, see yourself as maybe the president of the bank in 10, 15 years. And she said, oh, no, I work at the bank because I like the hours that I work. I'm actually studying to be a concert pianist. Yeah. And I said, oh, OK, because we were going to start first with chemotherapy to shrink her tumor and her positive nodes, mm -hmm. giving her neoadjuvant chemotherapy. The drug we were going to use, which is a very common drug to use, causes peripheral neuropathy numbness, tingling, and pain in the fingers and feet. Mm -hmm. For many patients, this doesn't go away. Now, how is she gonna become a concert pianist 
if we give her peripheral neuropathy. So as her navigator, I was on the, on the horn to her medical oncologist and said, we need to pick a different protocol or we will rob her of her passion, of her joy, of her life goal. And that's really getting, her pianist. That, yeah, that's really getting to that core of quality of life, right? And like, how would a patient know to even volunteer this information? Just having somebody there who knows the language of both sides and help that yes. step through what the consequences of certain choices might be. Patients and can be so scared that they will even say to me, those things in my future, they don't matter anymore. Just yes. save my life right now. And I'll say, we're, we're working on doing that, but we do want to know where do you see yourself? Um, this young woman, 29 year old, I said, you plan to have a family one day. And she said, yeah, we do. And I said, then I got to get you into fertility preservation or you will not be a biological mother when we finish giving you all the chemotherapy and hormonal therapy you're going to get. Yeah. Um, but if we don't, if we don't bring that up and factor that into the treatment planning process on the back end, she's going to have lost a lot of what was really important to her. And we want cancer to be a bump in the road, not a derailment, not a dead end. That's a very different story for those with, with stage four disease. They too have life goals and we want to help them achieve them. Oftentimes though, it might be in an alternative way. It might be that um, uh, she's got a six-year-old daughter right now, and we're anticipating this woman maybe surviving another year. I'm not going to say to her, we're going to fight as hard as we can so you can be here the day your daughter walks down the aisle with your husband to get married to that wonderful man she met. I'm not going to tell her that. I'm not going to give her false hope. I'm going to say, let's think about how you can fulfill that life goal. How can you still be here? for your daughter? How could you still instill your motherly advice yeah. and instill your values in her? And that's leaving her a recorded message, leaving her a, a wedding card that includes all of those things you wanted to tell her on that day. And she's still here doing that. And listening to you speak with those, all those specific examples and different life achieve balance. I'd like to come back now and, and talk about what you touched on at the beginning, um, Lily, and that is uh, having to do with social disparities, financial disparities. And as I mentioned, that's one of uh, the areas that I like to explore on the show. It's a passion of mine. And I'd like to hear from you about, you know, tell us about what's done to get breast cancer patients into the care system and to the next level, regardless of their income level? So first is giving them access to be able to come in for a screening mammogram, or if they have found something themselves, perhaps in the shower, they found a, a, a lump of, uh, of getting them in. And when it comes to underserved women, we've learned from a great deal of experience at Johns Hopkins we need to get them in now. So we may have done a community activity at their church. Uh, we do partner with churches. That's been very beneficial in being able to, uh, to have clergy, you know, tell the congregation, uh, you ladies out there, um, I want you to make sure that you're getting your annual mammograms. And we brought somebody today here from the church. And we also have a member of the congregation here to tell her story because she's never told anybody that she had breast cancer. She's kept it a secret. And we have a widower here who all of you know, who lost his wife to breast cancer because she didn't want to tell anybody that she had a problem here and it got out of control uh, so that it was too late to be able to save her life. So partnering with individuals in the community that, that the community trusts is, is really important. And when someone um, does call and say, I've got, uh, I've got a lump, we always ask their zip code because we, we need their whole address, but we start with their zip code. Okay. And we're going to be able to know just from that zip code, is this an underserved community? Mm -hmm. And if it is, we want to get them in within 24 hours. Um, uh, we, we don't want to say, oh, we'll, we'll give you an appointment in two weeks. She may have lost that foxhole religion or gotten more scared in that time frame. Mm -hmm. um, we have survivor volunteers 
who simply tell the individual, I'm a volunteer here at the breast center, doesn't say that she's had breast cancer herself. Um, and I'm gonna be here with you today while you're getting your mammogram. If we see something that warrants biopsy, we wanna pursue it and not delay that either because she might get so scared that she doesn't come back. So do everything that needs to be done. And it's at that point that survivor volunteer says, by the way, I'm not just a breast center volunteer, I'm also a breast cancer survivor. And then she'll tell her story that she had breast cancer 12 years ago, how she found it, what her treatment was, et cetera. That individual becomes a vision of hope now for that newly diagnosed patient. The patient is uh, then brought over to uh, the navigator um, in the breast center. We have several positions, several different navigators and depending on what the clinical situation looks like it's going to be, will determine which of the navigators that she will be assigned to. But we wanna jumpstart that relationship yeah. um, right away. And again, if it's an underserved uh, patient, we already know all the resources that we have available so that we can make that patient comfortable in, in telling us. And I'll say, you know, a lot of people, uh, not just here in Baltimore City, but across the country, need transportation for their appointments. Uh, you might take a bus uh, to work. How do you get to work? And she may say, I actually walk to work. And I said that I wouldn't expect you to need a car uh, in Baltimore City then, right? And she said, she said that's right, I, I don't have uh, my own transportation. I said, that's fine. I said, because I have transportation for you. Making it comfortable and okay, rather than saying, now are you gonna need transportation? Uh, she's probably not even gonna answer that question. And I don't want her to be a no-show. Right, That's, that would be terrible. Um, I also wanna schedule her appointments around her usual day. If she works from 8.30 to five o'clock each day, yeah. let's see if we can book her chemotherapy appointments for 5.30 because we can do that. Um, why would I wanna give her an appointment at one o'clock yeah. where she's gonna miss half a day of work? That, that doesn't make any sense for the drugs that she's receiving, when do the side effects happen? If they happen 24 hours later, I want this patient then to be getting her chemotherapy on Friday at 5.30, right? So that we're, we're keeping her, norm, her normalcy in her life as much as possible. If she comes in alone, I'm worried because we would have asked her to have a, a family caregiver accompany her for the discussions that we're gonna have about about treatment choices. And if she says, no, he can't afford to take off from work or no, I really don't have someone, then the navigator is stepping in in a bigger role, trying to be that that one-on-one -on -one support and also making sure that she does have at home what she's going to need, whether that be a home health nurse checking on her or uh, doing uh, through my chart uh, or through her cell phone using Zoom or some other method that we can check on her, literally see her um, in her home. And um, we also ask questions quite frankly about domestic violence. Um, when so, she but, is being examined, yeah. not, we don't just examine her breast, we examine her head to toe. Yeah. And if we're noting some things, uh, that navigator is gonna be the one that's gonna ask her about that, not at that moment, but at that next conversation of, by the way, I know just in both of your arms and, and you had some on your back and uh, they don't look like they would have happened from falling down. Do you have someone who's hurting you at home that uh, you can talk with me about and make it safe and comfortable to discuss so that we can get her into a safe environment and we will. You're giving so much color with, you know, how that nurse navigator really becomes a voice for the patient, um, just through all of the examples that you're sharing. Um, such a rich conversation, such an important topic. We're at the top of our time, but there's, and while I have both of you here, if you both have another 10 minutes to share, um, there's a couple other questions that I'd love to discuss with you. Okay. May I add one quick note? Um, I was... Uh, fortunate to work for the Pennsylvania Department of Health. Uh, and in our bureau, we had the Division of Cancer. And so, as you know, 
change happens at the community level and all the things that Louie has mentioned are so important, but our programs at the state level also do very similar things in making sure women who don't have access are underinsured or uninsured, get a mammogram, a pap smear, mm -hmm. and if they have problems, they get that linkage. Mm -hmm. And so there are lots of programs that will give access to Lilly and to other agencies that can then pick up and help that patient along uh, their journey. Thanks you so much for sharing that, Judy. And if there are particular links or examples, um, for example, in your state that you could share that will help our viewers see uh, where they can go so that they can get connected to resources like Lily, um, that would be tremendous. And I would love to share those after the show. So last couple questions before we wrap up uh, and I have both of you here. I wanna talk a little bit about AONN Plus. And um, where I wanna focus right now is about the free journal that AONN Plus has for cancer patients. It's called Conquer, the patient's voice. Yes. That's what we're talking about right now. Um, Lily, I'd first like to ask you to tell us a bit about it. And then after that, um, Lily and Judy, I'd like to ask you both for other resources that um, you can recommend for breast cancer patients. So Lily, first tell us a little bit about this resource, uh, Conquer, the patient's voice. Sure. So the Academy of Oncology Nurse and Patient Navigators that I founded 11 years ago, uh, <clears throat> we decided that we wanted to go beyond just having a peer re review journal for professionals that work in this field of navigation. We also wanted to have a, uh, a journal that was specifically for cancer patients and survivors, as well as their family caregivers. Mm -hmm. So uh, every other month um, it is published. I just uh, 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 signed off on the, on the uh, issue that will be uh, coming out in the mail uh, to patients next week. Mm -hmm. There are patient stories in it uh, that uh, where people share their experience as a patient what were the things that they were most challenged by? What were the things that they were surprised by? Uh, that uh, so, so some not so good things that happened and then some good things that also happened and then some takeaway messages of, of lessons learned. Nurse navigators and also some patient lay navigators also write articles for that particular uh, patient uh, journal describing, for example, how they go about reaching underserved patients and uh, the importance of not missing screening tests, the types of resources that are available locally, regionally, and nationally. And we always include articles that will feature a particular resource uh, that is available nationally uh, for financial assistance or uh, for uh, drug discount programs uh, and uh, free mammograms, uh, as, uh, as, as Judy was also uh, mentioning. The, the navigators that work within a healthcare system receive somewhere between 25 and 50 copies of this free uh, every other month so that they personally hand it to a newly diagnosed patient in clinic. Inside of it are several postcards. All the postcards are the same, but we do put a couple of them in there. And that postcard is something that then the individual that received that a journal can fill out uh, entering in their name and their address and drop it in, in the post office box. Then after that, they will now be on the mailing list to receive uh, this journal called Conquer the Patient's Voice Great. directly to their home. Terrific. Um, so we have about 200,000 people receiving it that way, which is wonderful. And uh, we get wonderful, wonderful feedback uh, from, from individuals too. And there's usually an article from a family caregiver, what their experience has been like. We're gonna help to um, promote it and get the word out so that people know to sign up for it. We already um, just had uh, a banner across um, the screen and we'll also share it after the show as well. Okay. So it sounds Thank amazing. Um, so now I'd like to switch to, you know, asking both of you, do you have any other resources that you'd recommend to breast cancer patients in particular? Judy, if you can start us out. I think when you're at the local level, uh, many places have support groups for women. Um, and uh, usually they are early stage or newly diagnosed. Uh, usually 
And it's interesting because there are a few that are for metastatic breast cancer patients. Uh, we have a tendency to scare, scare other women. Um, and that's not the intent. So uh, there is that. There are also uh, journaling programs uh, locally. Uh, networking is just a wonderful key when you uh, can join with others with common threads. Uh, there are certainly other agencies that are supporting uh, breast cancer and other cancers as well. So uh, community, community involvement, I think, is very important. I know, Lily, probably the for metastatic women, uh, there are retreats for metastatic breast cancer patients, which is a whole other topic. Um, I think the ma uh, matching programs are sometimes available also, which are very helpful. Uh, when I was first diagnosed, I worked with another gal and we created a coalition. And we would meet and I think the the most touching one for me was when everybody, we asked, what would you like to have this meeting? And they asked for an attorney, a funeral director, and a financial ad advisor to come and ask questions. And I think that when you have a group together, uh, it builds the strength and the courage to ask your questions um, with that common thread. But lest I forget, Lily mentioned something that is so important that is a sounding for everyone, even in this current pandemic, and that's don't postpone joy. Everyone should be embracing that now more than ever. Um, the other part of this is that um, hope is not a strategy, but I always share with individuals don't ever let anyone take away your hope. My definition of hope has changed many times, but I still have plenty of it. And fortunately for me, I have the strength to give it away. Those are such incredible words. Thank you, Judy. Um, don't postpone joy. I, I'd like to you know, just wrap up now, Judy. If um, I'd like to ask you and start out with a comment. You know, many of our guests on the show have told us about how hindsight can make things clearer to breast cancer patients. Is there anything that you would do differently looking back at your patient experience? Do you have any advice that you'd like to share? Any other advice um, with others living with advanced breast cancer? I think that I think looking back in instances like this aren't necessarily beneficial. I think that we build on our journey. And um, when I look at my journey, I feel that I made choices along the way and there aren't any that I would change. Um, and I have built on them and it has allowed me to grow. Um, I know that, that it started with simple things such as when you're going through chemo, there are times uh, it's so intense back in the day when I had it, it lasted six months. And there were days when you didn't just didn't want to hear the words breast cancer. One more time, you were ready to just blah. And I learned that to listen to my body and to my mind. And when it got too much to hear the word breast cancer, I did something with my body. And it might have been as funny as dance as if no one's watching even if it's wiggling a toe or tapping a foot, do it. Yeah. And when your body says this chemo has knocked you down, then you need to rest and do something with your mind. And there are lots of resources for that, especially now, um, calming techniques and things. If there are some that um, you found to be particularly helpful, I'd love to get those from you after the show and we can share those. So that is all the time that we have for this episode. Um, Lily, if you would have the time, I would love to perhaps have you back for a second episode where we focus more on the profession and kind of what, what you would need to do to become a nurse navigator. I think there's a lot of a rich conversation there that we didn't get a, a chance to talk about today. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Terrific. So I wanna thank you again both um, for helping us learn about nurse navigators 
and their vital role in patient care in breast cancer. So to our viewers, please tune in again next week for another episode. And remember that you can sign up for notifications so that you'll never miss one. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'll see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.